Hello everyone. Today we ask the question, is there still a place for desktop apps? Over to you, Martin. Thanks, Milani. So I think um, before we get into that, what is a desktop app? That's maybe a good place to start. So I'm just going to, I've got a lot <laughs> that I want to talk about today. <laughs> and I'll, you know me, I'm a bit scatterbrained sometimes. So I'm going to draw pictures just to uh, make sure I don't <laughs> derail myself. So pretty much in the past, you had, when you had a PC, and I, I mean, people talk about a PC, a personal computer, but these days when you, when you talk about a PC, people think you're talking about something that's got a Windows on it. So, okay, so you're either talking about a Windows PC um, or you're talking about a Mac, you know, uh, what, uh, a Mac PC with an Apple operating system on. So, I mean, typically, uh, when you install something on one of these desktop machines, and they call it desktop machines because, you know, typically people put their PCs or Macs on a, on a desktop, on a, a desktop space. So if you install it on here, it only has to run on here and on nothing else, um, then, you know, you call it a desktop, uh, desktop app. Now, the thing that's interesting is you can make one that's exclusively for Windows, or you could, you know, there were some things that you could make it cross-platform that with some minor changes, you could run on Windows and Macs. But essentially, you know, typically when you say uh, it's, it's a PC app, it will only install on Windows, for example. So the question is, if it's, uh, if, if, you know, is it dead? And the short answer is, uh, it's dead. Uh, so, yeah, so that's a short answer, and um, yeah. And Martin, why would you say desktop apps these days are dead? Because that's quite a statement for a lot of people who still believe in that. Okay, so why did people, why, why in the past was the, what did people prefer making a desktop app? Now, yes. if you look at the devs, uh, you know, we behind the scenes, um, what we did is when you, let's say, for example, in the old.net, you wanted to make something called the Windows Forms app. You had this lovely drag and drop environment where, you know, if you wanted to put an OK button on the screen, just drag and drop it on it. So it was, we call, I mean, it's great rapid application development because, because you, in, you know, most people's screen sizes were, you know, sort of of the same size, especially in the old days where you have, like 17 inch monitors, you know what the resolution was. You could just put your components there and box your uncle, and it's, so it's quick. And because this specific um, PC was, you know, running inside of an office environment, there was some clever IT guy <laughs> who was managing the firewall and whatever. So you didn't have to worry about security. It's just you drag and drop a few things, and whoops, you you make an installable EXE file, and you can run it on Windows. But then screens started to become bigger and different dimensions. And then we started getting mobile devices. So we, you know, we, cell phones started becoming more powerful and tablets started to come in. And, uh, you know, then Chromebooks came out where you basically buy a tablet that's pretty much all it has on as a web browser. Um, so then this whole, the whole thing of putting an OK button on a specific screen because you can assume all screen sizes are the same basically fell away. So, and then something was introduced for uh, Windows and used something called uh, uh, XAML, uh, which is a different way of doing your layouts. And then it became very similar to pretty much making a web page, the same kind of challenges, different screen sizes or whatever. So why would you go through all that hassles with, with longer development, why not just make it a progressive web app and get it over with. So, um, <laughs> so I asked my developer, um, oh yeah, and the other thing is, I mean, you used to have .NET version 5, I think it was one of the last old school .NET versions that came out. Now, .NET 5, you, you had a choice. You could do something with Windows Forms or you could do something with XAML. Now, with the new .core that was basically released and uh, uh, you know, after dot, um, after .NET, sorry, just a correction, I think this is for, forgive me, but anyway, the old .NET um, was replaced by Core, and then I think the Core became .NET 5. So pretty much with the old .NET, you had still have the choice of XAML and this, but when the new .NET Core came, .NET Core came out, which runs on any operating system, you know, Linux, Windows, whatever, um, there's no tool for 
building these desktop apps anymore. It doesn't exist. So, you know, <laughs> it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so, so if you want to build, yes. So that basically answers the question. Yes, so if you want to do it, you know, you have to do everything sort of by hand. We call the console app that you can still create. Now, a console app has got no user-friendly drag-and-drop environment for building your UI. It doesn't exist. Now you have to do everything by hand. So, you know, why would you do, you know, if you're going to, you might as well build a progressive web app that's responsive for all devices. You can, you're not going to save time or money by doing it. So it's not faster. Um, but I think there are some very, very niche cases where you might still need a desktop app. Let's say, for example, one, one example is, a, you know, a video editing software, for example. That's very resource intensive because your web app basically um, runs inside of uh, your web browser, although it doesn't look like it. Um, you know, it opens, it looks like it's an app, but it's, it's essentially using the web browser. So, you know, if there's obviously, if it's running inside the web browser, you know, on top of Windows, there's a sort of a performance penalty. Now, we're talking microseconds and milliseconds. So, you know, but when it's doing <laughs> video editing or image processing or, or if you're doing some interest, you know, serious hardware interfacing, you know, maybe, uh, maybe there's a case for it. Um, so, you know, so, yeah, so this is um, some of the scenarios that I can think of, but this is so niche, um, you know, it's very few businesses that would actually, you know, not everybody comes wanting their own, you know, video editing software, it's, it's usually big places that would, would need that. I even asked him, you know, in my senior developer, I had a chat with him, uh, so what about the life critical industry, like, for example, healthcare, medical hospitals kind of thing. Yeah. And even there, I mean, it's it's a they it would still recommend you know running it inside Chrome, you know, on a web browser. Still, PWA is a good solution because it can work offline. Now, um, something that's quite interesting, just to sort of confirm what I'm saying is, I mean, all of us uh, knows Microsoft Office, uh, you know. Uh, you've got Word, you've got Excel, you've got PowerPoint, all those wonderful things. Just by the way, it seems like Office 365. So in, in, in the past, you basically had your PC and you installed the software on your PC and you use it on your PC. Okay, great. Then uh, Office started to have, you know, the services in the cloud. Then you could go on your web browser and you could basically access your documents that are in the cloud. So that was sort of the next step of evolution. And it was, this is called Office 365. And then I know they started renaming it to Microsoft 365 apps, I think. So it's not called Office 365 anymore. So, um, but still you were using a web browser. And then something that happened recently is they started also making Word available as PWA. So, yeah. um, so if you go to your web browser, so you can basically go to Office 365. And if you go to Office 365, there's a plus button that you see. And if you click on that plus button, it installs the PWA on your device. So it can be confusing for some users because now you've got your Word, you installed it, and suddenly, whoops, here's a PWA. It looks very similar. It's actually hard to tell the difference. So now you've got two Word apps on your, on your, on your, on your PC. Mm -hmm. So Martin, that brings me to the question, why would Windows make um, Office a progressive web app? Yes, I think it's coming back to the thing. People aren't sitting in front of a big PC on a, on a table all day anymore. Um, you know, that same person probably has a mobile device and he's yeah. probably not in the office all day long. And if you have salespeople and whatever, he might have a tablet, he might have a Chromebook, he might have a Mac, who knows? So yeah. with Word, making it a PWA, now suddenly, yes, you could have gone into your web browser, but now, now for a lot of people, you have to go into a web browser, you have to log into Office 365. No, it's still a bit of a shit. PWA is just this thing that's an icon on your phone. It looks like any other app. So now suddenly you can use Word on your, uh, you know, Office 365, uh, whatever it's called, <laughs> on your, your PC, your tablet, your mobile device, you know, and this thing can be running on Windows. This thing could be running on Android, you know, it could be, uh, you know, a Mac device uh, with, with uh, iOS on it. 
Um, you know, it could be a Chromebook, right? <laughs> Pretty much, it doesn't really matter. Now suddenly, so I think what's happening is that Microsoft realized that it's, it's not selling operating systems anymore. You know, the days of everybody buying a PC and it comes out with Windows on it and be making a ton of money out of, uh, you know, people are buying fewer and fewer PCs and, um, you know, it's not just PCs, it's Chromebooks and, and whatever out there. It's, uh, you know, it's Apple and whatever. And people, people don't want to be tied to a single big machine sitting on a table. <laughs> and you have to be at a specific location to access your information. So now I want to throw a completely different question into the mix. Sure. How, does, how is this going to affect Google? Because Google has all of its free products. So how is that going to work? Because you will still pay for Office 365, whether you use it as an app or not. So how is that going to compare? Is it going to become a competitor, do you think? Yeah, so <laughs> it's quite ironic because, I mean, you used to have your PC with Word on it. And yes. people were so tied to that thing, they're not going anywhere. Um, now, now, and then Google came out with very disruptive technology. I mean, now you had to open something in your web browser and you, have, you can use Google Docs, you can use Google Sheets, you can use Google Slides, whatever it's called, um, you know, on your device. And you can use it on your mobile device and whatever. Um, and now you can use these things as sort of progressive web apps in a similar way. Actually, it's available as mobile apps, et cetera, et cetera. And now Microsoft has done the exact same thing. Yes. So, I mean, you can't get more direct competition than that. Both the documents are on the cloud. It's, you know, it's, it's available on a web browser. It's, it's, so now you've got direct competition. This one is free and this one is not. <laughs> so I think... Microsoft was probably secretly dreading this day <laughs> because yeah. they've got a, um, so <laughs> now when I say it's free, um, there's fine print to that, obviously. For yeah. the personal user who wants to use Google, um, you know, Google Docs, fair enough, it's free. But it's, it's designed for the personal, you know, the one person situation. The moment you start talking about organizations with multiple people and et cetera, et cetera, you know, that's when you need to either be subscribed to Office 365 or whatever it's called, or you need to be subscribed to um, Google G Suite. It used to be called G Suite, now it's called Google Workspace. Okay. So yes, you can, as an individual, use Google for free, um, you know, Google Docs for free. But the moment you go Google Workspace, you can, yes, you're going to use this, the same thing, but it's not technically free anymore because you're paying for your cloud storage per user. And, um, but if you really want it to be, if you're a small business and you don't want the advantage of Google, Google Workspace, you could set up a personal, you know, everyone could use its own personal account, but it's going to bite you at some point. <laughs> you can maybe do that for a while, but you're going to outgrow it. So... For smaller businesses, this is a better option. But when it comes to bigger businesses, obviously, it's not. Yeah, there is some pain involved with taking these, each individual account nice to migrate and whatever. So you're just postponing what's going to happen eventually. So if you can, my recommendation is, you know, it's, you're not breaking the bank with the user fee on this thing. Just the, uh, the sooner you bite the bullet, the better. But if you don't have confidence that your business is going to make it fair enough, you know, I, I get it. Free is always, you know, <laughs> free is always attractive, um, but you're just postponing the inevitable of paying per user, basically. So the big question becomes now, uh, you've got Porsche and Ferrari, which one are you going to choose? True story. So if I have to sum this up, in terms of desktop apps, it's only for niche markets these days. And even if Microsoft started or Windows have started thinking about doing progressive web apps, that means, well, the logical explanation would be that they are thinking that they need to create a new market um, for themselves to stay competitive. That's, that's right. So you've got Office moving in that direction. You've got Google already, I mean, I already mentioned it. 
Uh, I mean, yeah, at the bottom, you can see I've got Google Drive, Gmail, I've got Calendar, I've got Google Contacts, all of these things running, you know, as way back. Then even um, Google has got its Meet that's now a progressive web app. You've got, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. So there's definitely, the big boys are moving in this direction. And uh, so you have to ask a question, <laughs> you know, for the, for the people who's throwing billions of dollars into technology or moving in that direction, the rest will follow. And I mean, if you look at the, the fact that, my, that, you know, for from a developer perspective, they're not even giving any attention to making, you know, desktop apps, uh, something that's easy for developers. It's just like, I mean, the, the, the message is very clear. It's dead. It's, it's dead. And I think micro, the, the good news for Microsoft is as a company has woken up to the reality that it can't sell um, operating systems for desktop PCs anymore. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, they, it, it, they are sort of reinventing themselves over the years. And this is not something that started yesterday. I mean, this has become, you know, it's just been going on for a long time. So, yes. It's dead. It's dead. <laughs> <laughs> So, Michael, <laughs> so Michael, thank you very much for this very interesting facts. I think we've made quite a few statements today, something to give us food for thought. And uh, yeah, we'll check in next week with another um, session with Martin from Tech Genius. And this is me, Milani Foxcroft from MF Consulting. We'll see you next time.